Hi, everyone. Uh, as you know, I'm one of the new faculty at UNIM, uh, Dr. Nick Yozin. I wanted to introduce a mentor of mine through my training uh, in residency over at University of Hawaii, uh, Dr. Gerald Bush. He joined the faculty at UH in 2019 after he retired from uh, private uh, or psychiatric practice in Houston, Texas for 27 years. Um, he is currently the assistant professor of psychiatry and associate program director of the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship at University of Hawaii. Um, he serves as the site director uh, for forensic psychiatry for residency training at the Oahu Community Correctional Center. He's also the director of medical education and patient care for Queens Medical Center um, for the psychiatry emergency department. Um, Dr. Bush is board certified uh, in general psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, um, he's trained, he's qualified in addiction medicine as well and forensic psychiatry. Um, and he currently serves on the University of Hawaii Manoa Faculty Senate, and he's chair of the Committee on Professional Matters and co-chair of the Committee on Educational Effectiveness. Um, he has a particular interest in public health aspects of mental health and substance use disorders. Um, he's obtained also a master's in public health uh, uh, from George Washington University in 2018. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Gerald Bush. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that, Greg. Uh, today's title is F15.259, and that's the CPT code for uh, uh, methamphetamine-induced psychotic disorder. Uh, the reason I, I use that is we're required to, to enter the code and... Um, after I started working in the emergency room at the Queens Medical Center in Hawaii, I started uh, noticing how frequently the diagnosis uh, occurred. Uh, so today uh, we'll review uh, the disclosures uh, and uh, start with the molecular history of ICE, uh, review uh, what is meant by the methamphetamine toxidrome, uh, look at uh, literature, evidence-based emergency department uh, management algorithm for uh, methamphetamine-induced psychosis or methotoxidrome, and then uh, we'll end by uh, looking at a novel approach um, to improve the uh, psychiatric ED emergency department uh, clinical training experience. Um, so hopefully there'll be some helpful ideas in here uh, somewhere. Uh, so uh, no corporate sponsorship. Uh, I haven't even been asked to do anything. I'm a little embarrassed. No off-label therapies uh, and uh, um, uh, no relationship with any uh, industry or uh, company that could be uh, construed as a conflict of interest. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, learning objectives, uh, be able to describe uh, the ideal setting and timeline for managing methamphetamine uh, toxidrome, uh, which we'll uh, review uh, the definition of shortly, uh, discuss uh, proper lab evaluation uh, for this as well, and identify what medications our uh, state of the art or, or viewed as best. And uh, then we'll relate your uh, newfound comprehension to, uh, or you'll be able to relate this to other uh, emergency department uh, medical staff and uh, nursing and, uh, and other uh, staff. Uh, so the uh, emergency uh, psychiatry uh, training, the emergency room is uh, the portal of uh, uh, highest acuity uh, for patient care. And um, uh, residents uh, in our uh, department sometimes complain that they're uh, too busy. And uh, the thing is, um, the busier they are, the, the better, because after a while, it's, it's like a deep learning algorithm. The more cases you see in the emergency department, uh, the uh, deeper the learning is. And after a few years, you become remarkably competent uh, at managing any uh, psychiatric emergency um, 
and uh, learn to sort of uh, do it from a almost a, a gut level. So I consider it to be sort of a, a central aspect of, of uh, training uh, for a psychiatric uh, residency. Now, um, the usual psychiatric emergency department curriculum focuses on uh, agitation, uh, suicide risk, uh, substance uh, related conditions and uh, medical complexity. Um, let's see, uh, bear with me one moment because it seems like we, I'm missing some slides here. Going to temporarily exit from here. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, go to slide. Uh, so the the uh, uh, intensity of the emergency department curriculum allows the resident to basically be prepared for anything that, that comes their way. Uh, so uh, the psychiatric emergency department curriculum and the, the standard curriculum uh, was developed in the uh, 1990s and hasn't really changed since then, uh, but consists of uh, learning uh, emergency uh, interventions, diagnosing emergency conditions, and emergency interventions and as a clinical learning laboratory for, for residents. So initially when residents uh, uh, come, and this is one of our uh, former uh, residents, they have a high degree of excitement and enthusiasm. Uh, they're, they're happy to get into the emergency department and, and ready to get to work. Uh, but then after a while, they sort of... Uh, are inundated by all these different uh, variations. These are all the different CPT codes for different forms of uh, methamphetamine uh, um, dependence or use or intoxication or withdrawal and that sort of thing. So after a while they feel basically overwhelmed. And I've even heard um, more seasoned clinicians that at the other uh, major psychiatric hospital in, in uh, Hawaii saying, if we could only do something, if, if uh, we didn't have to focus on, on all of the patients that are coming in with uh, methamphetamine-induced psychotic disorder. Uh, so the greatest uh, number of cases that, that we see, uh, sort of the greatest of all time of our psychiatric diagnosis, in our emergency department is F15.259. And the uh, technical definition, CPT is other stimulant dependence with stimulant-induced psychotic disorder, uh, unspecified. Uh, so in order to uh, understand this a little better, we'll take a step back for a moment and uh, look a little bit at the history of development of uh, methamphetamine. Uh, so, uh, methamphetamine, um, like, uh, all substances of abuse has its origin in a plant. Now you might think, well, alcohol, uh, isn't a plant product, but, but it is a fermented, uh, plant product. Uh, but all, uh, substances seem to, uh, in some form or fashion emanate, uh, originally from the plant. Uh, so methamphetamine emanates from ephedra or ma huang, which was first documented about 5,000 years ago. Uh, Greg may have the reference for that. Uh, and uh, 
In 1885, the uh, active alkaloid uh, for ephedrine was isolated. Now, um, in uh, 1887, uh, uh, amphetamine uh, was synthesized using the skeleton from ephedrine by a Romanian chemist named Lazar Adelan Adelanu. Uh, and uh, this occurred uh, in Germany in some of the some of the most uh, advanced uh, organic chemistry uh, at the time was being conducted uh, by German uh, organic chemists. So here you could see um, the comparison of ephedrine, uh, which uh, basic uh, um, uh, amphetamine uh, or uh, 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 phenyl uh, isopropyl uh, nucleus. Uh, and amphetamine is derived uh, by uh, dehydroxylating uh, the uh, uh, group from the uh, uh, carbon chain uh, and uh, um, putting uh, an extra hydrogen uh, in place of a methyl group. Uh, so this uh, was a pretty major accomplishment in organic chemistry. Then in 1893, uh, methamphetamine was synthesized, and this was done by a Japanese organic uh, chemist, Nagayoshi Nagai. And uh, here you could see uh, that uh, methamphetamine um, has an extra uh, uh, methyl group, uh, so it's more um, hydrophobic. It, it uh, crosses the uh, blood-brain barrier even more easily. Uh, than uh, uh, amphetamine does. And uh, then in 1919, uh, ice, the uh, crystalline uh, form of methamphetamine, uh, was synthesized by the uh, ice maker Akira Ogata, uh, first synthesis of methamphetamine in a crystalline form. Again, the, the chemical structure is still the the same, uh, but uh, um, uh, this again has the uh, two uh, methyl groups making it uh, um, more lipid soluble and more easily, uh, more apt to cross the blood brain barrier. And then to go back, the amazing thing is there's just not a lot of difference between ephedrine and uh, methamphetamine. Uh, unless you're sort of a mild uh, ephedrine uh, user, uh, you won't have the same uh, problems with uh, psychosis and severe uh, substance use disorders. You do methamphetamine, but you could see how similar they are. Uh, the only thing that's different is the hydroxyl group. And you can imagine that one hydroxyl group sort of um, makes the uh, chemical uh, more hydrophilic and uh, a little less apt to zoom in across the blood brain barrier and have an impact on the, the brain. Uh, but you could see there's very little difference otherwise. Uh, now we'll take a look at the methamphetamine toxidrome. So the first question is, uh, what is that? Uh, so, uh, um, the uh, sympathomimetic uh, toxidrome. Uh, toxidrome's a portmanteau of uh, toxic and uh, syndrome, which uh, is just a combination of, of two words. One of our residents asked me if that was a port near uh, Quebec. Uh, but uh, the toxidrome is a combination of psychosis and delirium. And it turns out with uh, repeated uh, methamphetamine use, um, uh, especially a prolonged methamphetamine use, the the amount of psychosis and uh, accompanying level of confusion and uh, refractoriness of a psychotic episode uh, get get worse uh, with uh, more time and exposure uh, to methamphetamine. Uh, so uh, emergency room doctors, will call this a toxidrome. Uh, it basically means sort of a form of uh, poisoning where there's a delirium involved. 
We don't use that term, uh, but in the emergency department literature, uh, you, you'll you see the use of the term. And it even makes sense when we see patients sometimes. It's not like they're sitting there and can describe uh, uh, psychosis. Oh, I'm hearing voices. Uh, they'll be uh, really out of it with some confusion and the resultant more serious problems of uh, agitation, uh, physical aggression. Uh, so here are some of the symptoms um, that I'm just mentioning, agitation, aggression, uh, psychosis, uh, confusion, uh, of course, autonomic hyperactivity. And uh, they're uh, very difficult to, to engage at all. Now, uh, the autonomic hyperactivity is a little bit of a problem now with the uh, emergence of the um, uh, opioid epidemic. Why, why is that? Uh, well, um, uh, it used to be that uh, we would use vital signs to assess the degree of withdrawal that an uh, patient with opioid use disorder is experiencing. So uh, as they go into withdrawal, and their locus ceruleus becomes more active, their blood pressure and pulse go way up. So it really um, confounds a picture where there's a combination of substance use. Um, but suffice it to say that somebody with uh, autonomic hyperactivity it may be difficult to discern whether they're having opioid withdrawal or meth intoxication, but they could be having uh, both. And that's a problem that I think we're all uh, encountering uh, more and more. Um, so uh, in our state, the process of involuntary uh, hospitalization is uh, called an MH1. Um, in other states, it could be called an order of protective custody, but this is a mechanism for uh, police to bring uh, patients in uh, that they feel they, they may be breaking the law, but the police feel they may need mental health treatment more than, than being uh, just uh, arrested. Uh, so there's a mechanism for them to uh, detain and bring people in, and generally, Patients with this uh, toxidrome or this conditioning are uh, often uh, threatening, uh, aggressive, and uh, remarkably uh, uncooperative. Um, now, uh, usually the rule is, uh, it's not like uh, the patients are just aficionados uh, of, of uh, methamphetamine only when I uh, first came to Hawaii, I worked in a, a walk-in uh, clinic in a, a part of town that ha had a lot of uh, homeless uh, patients at that time. And we would uh, drug screen everyone just so we could get some idea of the epidemiology of uh, substance use. And generally the urine drug screens were positive for a number of different things. Uh, so it's very unusual to see someone who's just only using uh, methamphetamine. Uh, nowadays, of course, your problem is the um, mixture finding uh, uh, fentanyl uh, in there as well, or other, other opioids. Uh, the clinical course um, is a period of uh, eight to 16 hours uh, some people refer to this as metabolizing. And the problem is sometimes that the clinical course is confounded by the use of uh, sedatives uh, and other medications to stabilize the agitation and psychosis. Um, but um, this course uh, where the patient basically eventually conks out and is asleep for a prolonged period of time uh, does help to clarify the diagnosis. Uh, and again, um, there has to be some careful discernment uh, between this and uh, 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 opioid uh, toxicity. Um, sometimes the patient may come in uh, uh, and uh, be uh, opiate 
uh, toxic and maybe initially awake and alert, but as the opiates uh, set in, they they uh, become more uh, listless and somnolent. Uh, of course, in that case, uh, their pupils would be really small, and with uh, methamphetamine uh, uh, intoxication, they're they're dilated. Uh, but it still is a very uh, crucially important discernment. Because uh, uh, someone can uh, die from uh, opiate uh, intoxication, from respiratory depression, and uh, has a much higher mortality rate than methamphetamine intoxication. Um, so, uh, um, uh, what I'll discuss today are the latest uh, methods for stabilizing. Uh, patients who present with acute uh, uh, agitation uh, and confusion uh, from methamphetamine uh, toxicity. And the most important aspect of treatment is to initially um, place the patient in a, a dimly lit, uh, low stimulation environment. Now, in our facility, these rooms are called uh, P rooms. And I know now um, newer units, uh, empath units, often have some, some extra uh, space to the side where it's uh, quieter, darker, low stimulation. Uh, but there seems to be pretty good agreement across the literature spectrum. Uh, what's interesting is uh, some of the emergency management literature comes from uh, Europe. Uh, where methamphetamines uh, uh, have uh, been spreading for the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, now, the interesting thing is um, that uh, last century, there were uh, three methamphetamine epidemics in, uh, in Japan. Uh, two of them resolved with intensive uh, public health measures. The third one is still ongoing. There was a methamphetamine uh, epidemic in uh, Sweden as well, and it spread to Norway, but um, uh, people can literally uh, see them uh, spreading from one country to another. Uh, but a lot of the uh, literature on management has come from Europe as well. Uh, so uh, if the patient comes in and they're um, uh, toxic on methamphetamine, they're, uh, say, ha have mild agitation, uh, elevated vital signs and anxiety, but they're able to cooperate and be engaged. Uh, there's nothing wrong with treating them with uh, diazepam, uh, 10 milligrams PO. Um, for more uh, acute management, um, say they're uh, more agitated but still cooperative, um, benzodiazepines can be used. Now, in our facility, the emergency room doctors are usually the ones that give midazolam. Uh, the psychiatrists uh, uh, don't seem to be the ones that, that do that. We might give Valium, but we would give it PO. Um, so it interests me that a lot of times they suggest giving it parenterally in the literature, but they must have some pretty cooperative patients in order to be able to put an IV line in. So usually it's given uh, I am. Now, uh, if the uh, uh, patient gets a benzo uh, for some reason, uh, in the studies in Europe, this was felt to be best. And so they, their dictum was uh, benzodiazepines are the first line treatment for uh, methamphetamine uh, uh, toxicity, uh, either diazepam or, or midazolam. Uh, midazolam's, um, I feel a little better. It seems to work uh, quickly, uh, but more importantly, it has a shorter half-life than diazepam, which sort of has more of a mid-range half-life. Uh, now, uh, in the United States, uh, there seems to be an increasing trend in the emergency department literature to use droperidol. Uh, for a period of time, it was felt droperidol was cardiotoxic, but 
when those cases were reviewed and there had, had been a result in black box warning. Um, when those cases uh, were re reviewed more carefully, it was felt that uh, lower doses of uh, droperidol, five to 10 milligrams were perfectly safe. And that's been borne out with uh, resumption of uh, widespread use of droperidol. Uh, why would this be better than using a benzo uh, as a first line choice for agitation and uh, uh, aggression in, an agita in, a, in a toxic uh, patient with methamphetamine psychosis? Well, first of all, um, your uh, uh, benzos, uh, especially if they're repeated several times, can cause over sedation. Uh, some of the literature said respiratory depression, but I haven't seen that with benzos. But I imagine uh, that the level of sedation uh, can be concerning. Secondly, benzodiazepines are not going to really do much for psychotic symptoms. Um, the other thing is that um, in our emergency room, uh, one of our main quality measures is the length of stay. And uh, we felt that we were confounding the, the length of stay. We were uh, uh, unnecessarily complicating it uh, with the uh, treatment, with the, the medications that we were uh, giving the, the uh, patients. Uh, now, uh, laboratory evaluation, um, uh, everybody uh, in the emergency department uh, seems to agree on getting uh, a urine drug screen. Um, but I, for some reason, have trouble getting um, the physicians to get a CBC and CMP. They feel that uh, there are so many of these patients and what are we going to do about this? Uh, um, uh, but it seems like it's just part of good patient care, uh, especially since um, the patients in this cohort, especially if they're homeless, can have a much reduced uh, life expectancy uh, from chronic uh, cardiac complications of uh, methamphetamine use. Um, even more importantly, especially for chronic methamphetamine users, the emergency department literature recommends getting an EKG, a troponin, and a creatine kinase uh, to rule out uh, acute cardiac damage. Um, unfortunately, in our emergency department, uh, we're not able to do this. Uh, the patients, the emergency room uh, doctor will often say, well, uh, he's not really complaining of chest pain. And I have to explain to them, you could probably you know, hit them in the head with a ball peen pan hammer and they wouldn't complain of pain right now. They're pretty full of this stimulant medication. Uh, um, I think at one time we, or there was actually a study uh, in the level of uh, cardiac complications uh, from uh, methamphetamine use is quite high because it subjects the Hard to sort of an extraordinary uh, stress test every time it's it's used. So uh, here's a nice algorithm uh, from one of the papers, and and uh, uh, I can provide the uh, references on request. But basically, uh, after <clears throat> after admission to the uh, psychiatric emergency department, um, the main uh, um, factor to decide um, what direction to go with the patient is whether they are uh, violent and, and aggressive. Uh, so um, if they're able to uh, uh, either remain calm or be uh, stabilized uh, with a small dose of a benzodiazepine, uh, can be considered that they can be uh, discharged if they're showing it, uh, uh, any kind of psychiatric uh, symptoms, they may be admitted to the psychiatric unit. Now, unfortunately, our psychiatric unit is often full, so we have to do more of the management in the emergency room. But in this algorithm, uh, if the patient is agitated, then uh, our current 
practice and the, the main practice recommended in the emergency department literature is to give uh, droperidol. Uh, previously, people used Haldol. Uh, what's the difference or what's the benefit? Uh, the amazing thing about droperidol is that it works uh, as fast if given IM as it does IV. And uh, um, if that if the patient's severely agitated, a combination of droperidol and midazolam can be given. And it's hard to find something more effective than this. They can be reassessed after a period of 15 minutes and the dosage is repeated. But it, it does seem like this is a pretty effective combination of uh, uh, medications to give. And once they're more stable, they can either be admitted uh, for further observation or kept in the emergency department till they're more stable and, and ready for discharge. Now uh, we'll go to the what I call the uh, magic show portion. Uh, I have to uh, put things like that in there to regain, reaccess the attention of the uh, residents. And uh, also I'm working on my uh, presentation for the newbie conference in, in Las Vegas. I know people are big on magic shows there, uh, but there won't be any actual uh, magic show. I don't wanna be mis misleading. Uh, but this is uh, basically uh, sort of a fresh or innovative way to approach emergency room education. So uh, um, in our emergency room or in any emergency room, there will be a, a prevalence of some particular type of disorder. Uh, in uh, New England, for example, or along I-95 for a long time, a frequent emergency room presentation was opioid overdose. Uh, now they also have a uh, higher amount of methamphetamine toxicity. Um, but uh, in any given day, there'll be a significant number of emergency department visitors, a disproportionate number uh, that have a positive for methamphetamine. And this in our uh, facility is a little less than a third, about 30% of the cases come in. Uh, maybe more because the number of the patients with this presentation refuse or don't don't get a year of drug screen, don't cooperate, aren't able to cooperate. Um, now the other thing is, um, since the and the, I think this is the most important point uh, for for the curricular development, when the emergency department psychiatric uh, residency curriculum models. Uh, there's just one model really developed by uh, uh, Glick and uh, colleagues in the 1990s. But when they developed that model, there wasn't near the level of substance use epidemic that there is now. Um, I remember in my residency training in 1987, there was just a very uh, robust uh, balance of suicide attempts, uh, uh, psychosis, uh, maybe alcohol intoxication, um, but not anything like the level that's permeated the emergency departments now. And that's another reason I think that the um, emergency department manuals um, curriculum uh, could be updated. I, I think that alone uh, would, would be a reason. But even in the last few years, the number of cases has, has gone up. So in our uh, uh, facility, for example, um, uh, the yellow is uh, 2019. These are data collected, by the way, by Dr. Brett Liu. Uh, from our emergency department. Um, uh, so uh, the uh, green, I'm sorry, green is 2018, uh, yellow is 2019, and uh, red is 2020, showing sort of the, the uh, uh, progression over a period of 12 months. 
Uh, so these data show that the number of uh, positives of um, uh, uh, for uh, methamphetamine on the urine drug screen have gradually uh, uh, increased uh, over the last uh, few years. This is unfortunately uh, the most recent data. Uh, when it comes to uh, 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 data, I know people are trying to get uh, contemporaneous data, but even the, say, the NASDA data uh, sort of lags by a few years. So any policies people make sort of like steering a car by looking out the back window. Uh, and uh, here's another kind of representation of this data showing a gradual increase. I don't know how it is in your emergency department, but I know nationally the level of substance abuse uh, skyrocketed since emergency department uh, model, the model curriculum was designed in the 1990s. Uh, so basically, uh, this is a proposal for a revision in, in how people are trained. And so traditionally, uh, we teach the residents about how to manage agitation, how to assess uh, suicide and uh, substance related issues, and uh, finally, uh, any kind of uh, medical complexity that might have a combination of uh, psychiatric findings. Uh, so all of these topics are still, mu must be uh, taught and are needed. Uh, and um, uh, they're uh, uh, needed and also in terms of uh, uh, basic resident competence and, and learning. Uh, but again, uh, the resident wants to be prepared for anything. But when they work in the emergency department, they also experience a high level of anxiety because they're never sure what's going to roll in next and how to how to handle it. Now, over a period of years, they get more comfortable. So this uh, curriculum, this particular one, is built around this diagnosis of FF15 methamphetamine uh, use disorder. Uh, it can be built around any, whatever the most prominent uh, diagnosis uh, for that particular site is, though. Uh, so I'm not sure where this would be, but if uh, more preponderance of the patients have borderline personality or something, it can be built around that. Uh, but basically, the curriculum is streamlined around this, and I call it a diagnosis center and emergency department curriculum. But what it does is sort of provide additional training, uh, precision, and skill uh, for that particular diagnosis, in this case, methamphetamine uh, use disorder. Uh, so this was sort of a joke. Uh, I think this was written after that movie Taken came out. Uh, for the incoming PGY1s, we may not know what medical school you are from, but we can tell you that you will develop a very particular set of skills, skills you will acquire over a very long career as a resident, skills that make you a nightmare for diseases like F15.259. So in other words, the residents are taught uh, about this most prominent diagnosis in a way where they don't feel just competent, but highly competent with it. Uh, so uh, we considered making more specialized notes. Uh, we did go ahead and uh, sort of publicize this algorithm to help the resident. We suggested specialized order sets, uh, cardiovascular oriented labs and EKG, but we didn't get buy-in from our emergency uh, medical department colleagues. Uh, we were able to train uh, nurses and managers more so the approach uh, to methamphetamine toxicity and psychosis was, was standardized in the department. Uh, so the benefits are that uh, this gives a structured approach uh, adds predictability and uh, uh, arms everyone with a particular clinical strategy that they can apply for this most uh, frequent diagnosis. And this just sort of shows, uh, in our case, uh, it was uh, about 30% uh, 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 of cases uh, that were presenting with this diagnosis. But any 
uh, diagnosis-centered uh, curriculum uh, would uh, focus on that. Now, does this cheat the other diagnoses? Does this make it harder for people to learn? Uh, in actuality, what this does, since it streamlines the treatment for the most frequent diagnosis, it al allows residents uh, more time and energy to focus on other types of cases. Um, since our uh, uh, facility is the... Um, it's the only uh, and main uh, level one trauma center for the entire Pacific Basin. So if there's any types of uh, cases or problems occurring anywhere in the Pacific, and sometimes even the Pacific uh, Rim will get cases from Japan that they can't treat there and that sort of thing. Uh, so we had one case, there was a girl in an, a research atoll that was about a thousand miles south of uh, of Hawaii, and uh, she had a, a type of uh, anorexia nervosa and was flown into us uh, weighing about uh, 85 pounds or something of that nature. But it allows the residents more time uh, to be able to focus on, on those other types of uh, cases that come in because they're not quite so busy sort of trying to figure out or map out uh, uh, what's going on with the predominant presentation of case. Uh, so this training strategy allows more predictability, organization, it increases the resident sense of security, gives the residents a feeling, look, you know, this is the case that I'm going to run into with a little more likelihood, and uh, it gives them a little... Uh, uh, reduction in their anxiety about what they're going to encounter in the emergency department. Um, so uh, this uh, hopefully yields a more uh, pleasant and enjoyable, uh, if there can be one, emergency department training experience. Uh, now it's applicable to any emergency department and it just works by identifying and centering around the uh, mo more uh, preponderant diagnosis. Um, the uh, shortcomings of the model are that um, this is a hypothesis. This is a suggestion. Uh, I don't have any educational effectiveness data on this. Uh, this focus, though, did allow us to develop a quality improvement project uh, at one time um, uh, last year and some years before that, everybody that was coming in with agitation was getting a combination of Haldol and Ativan. And um, it seemed that it could be contributing to protracted stay uh, in the, the hospital, in the emergency department. So we started a, a quality improvement project where we educated the emergency room doctors. We convince the pharmacy to order and get droperidol. And uh, we sort of had droperidol day where, no, not all the, or not everyone in the ER got droperidol, but we had uh, pizza and balloons and flyers about using the droperidol and what the benefits are. Uh, and the measures were for performance improvements, did it reduce elapsed time in the emergency department uh, while uh, not having an increase in recurrence of aggression. And so far, the data, which I don't have, are sort of promising in that in that regard. Um, I think that's that's it for this presentation, and I'm happy to take uh, any uh, uh, questions uh, or concerns about this uh, 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 strategy for teaching or any questions about uh, uh, treating uh, uh, F15.259. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Bush, uh, uh, for, for this terrific, um, you know, walk through uh, a very common diagnosis for us uh, uh, as well, like it sounds uh, for, for you in Hawaii. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat, one from Dr. Paula Hensley. Any concern about QTC prolongation with droperidol or, or any other safety concerns with antipsychotic use in methamphetamine psychosis? 
Um, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, for the first uh, few months we used it, uh, even the emergency department doctors uh, uh, decided to get uh, EKGs. It turns out as long as the dose is around five to 10 milligrams, uh, so far we we didn't see any problems with QTC. Uh, I didn't see anything in the literature either uh, about patients having uh, uh, problems with that, but that's a very interesting question that, that definitely uh, I think I'd have to do a little more specific uh, review of the literature in that, that regard. Um, but I did see that the uh, recommended treatment uh, um, for methamphetamine toxicity, agitation, toxidrome, psychosis uh, for quite a long time. Uh, his, one of the treatments has been Haldol and haven't seen any issues regarding uh, elevated QTC or increase in fatal arrhythmias or mortality with that treatment. Uh, hey, Dr. Bush, this is uh, Brant Hager. Um, thanks for your presentation. I was curious if you could uh, uh, describe uh, what is what it is about droperidol um, from a kinetic or dynamic standpoint that that separates it out from the other um, antipsychotics and its usefulness in this in this instance. Um, the two things that make it of benefit here, uh, thank you for asking that question because I don't think I was entirely entirely clear about both of them. Uh, but the first thing is the one uh, <clears throat> uh, thing I mentioned regarding its uh, onset of action is similar for IM versus IV. In other words, it, it seems like if you just give it IM that it works as quickly as if you gave it parenterally. And the second thing that's that's great about it, and this is why I appreciate your question, uh, that I didn't say, and that is uh, its um, uh, half-life is shorter uh, than Haldol. Uh, it wears off after uh, four to six hours. That's why when we started the, the uh, program, we were worried, well, it's not going to last as long. So are these people going to wake up agitated and need, you know, another injection? That was the concern. Um, the half-life of other combinations of medications we were giving, uh, not, not Ativan, of course, um, but Haldol um, or uh, Olanzapine sometimes was given, um, is longer. Uh, so uh, um, uh, it we felt this was uh, creating a situation where the patient was sort of knocked out for an even longer period of time. So the two advantages of droperidol are number one, uh, if given IM, the onset of action is as fast as IV, and number two, it has a shorter half-life. Also, it seems um, uh, very effective for uh, um, managing agitated and aggressive patients. Uh, see, sometimes people who haven't gotten on the droperidol bandwagon, so to speak, will give other neuroleptics and patient will stay really agitated or violent. Um, and then they get the droperidol and it, it seems to work. Uh, so that's a third aspect is it seems like a very effective uh, medication. Would it be okay for me to ask a follow-up question about that, uh, Dr. Bush? Of course. Um, the Because um, it makes sense empirically for, based on what people are seeing. And uh, sometimes when when I'm um, interacting with residents and or, or other providers, it's it's nice to have both an empiric and kind of a, uh, also like a mechanistic kind of a explanation to to help convince somebody else. And so I'm wondering about like it's it's um, if there are unique features of its of its binding profile that that lead to that rapid sedation and 
and um, and tranquilization that's distinct from the other antipsychotics, or if it's a mystery. Um, that's a great question, and uh, my, I regret to say that I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it is that that uh, gives it its uh, uh, unique properties or or effectiveness. Um, I think the thing was it. Uh, as Dr. Hen Hensley's mentioning, it used to be used much more routinely until that black box warning popped out. And she's absolutely right. People used to use it at higher dosages. So that may have been one of the things that contributed uh, to the problem of it um, uh, causing uh, uh, cardiac uh, uh, problems. But as far as its uh, chemical properties uh, or binding or um, why it, it may work in a superior fashion. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. Thank you, Dr. Bush. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, if I may, Dr. Bush, um, I have one comment and one question. My comment is thank you for, for giving this talk. I, I thought it was really helpful and it helped me particularly, I've been reviewing test items for the MBME and creating test items as well. And one of the items that I was going to discuss with my committee was um, the use of droperidol in the ER and subsequent you know, on this test item, subsequent NMS observed after that. And I had this discussion with my committee about how, well, we don't really use droperidol anymore. And so maybe it's not a relevant test question, but you've um, reassured me that it is truly relevant. So thank you for your teaching on that item. And then my question for you is you mentioned the uh, significant methamphetamine toxicity to cardiac and blood pressure. Um, you know, traditionally as an educator, we have taught our trainees, particularly medical students, that cocaine um, tends to have more of a vasospasm kind of effect and methamphetamines and the amphetamines have had a history of research about necrotizing arteritis and more peripheral vascular kinds of problems. And when you look at test questions or at patients and you see excessive blood pressure elevations, I, I think sometimes more cocaine toxicity rather than methamphetamine toxicity. Would you say that that remains accurate or does that need to be readjusted in terms of our new epidemic of very toxic and very frequently used methamphetamine? Um, that I, I am not sure, but I can tell you that um, uh, first of all, all the methamphetamine in the United States and Hawaii appears to come from a single cartel in Mexico, first of all, and the purity is exceptional. Uh, so that could have a lot to do with it from the um, uh, previous uh, observations or interpretations. Uh, somehow now the product is, is really great, unfortunately. Uh, oddly, all the methamphetamine in the South China Sea region uh, is from uh, northern Myanmar, uh, from uh, gangs there, and it flows into China. You could find a lot of literature uh, about methamphetamine use disorders in China, although it seems more and more difficult to communicate with psychiatrists or researchers there. And same for the Philippines and all the other countries in that region, for some reason, I think because of the the mail and air routes between Hawaii and uh, the mainland, it all comes from the same place. Uh, but uniformly, uh, the patients have uh, very elevated uh, pulse and, and blood pressure. So it could have to do. Uh, the other thing is on the relevance of the test questions, it seems like every uh, board exam should have some questions on it that are completely uh, irrelevant. I remember what the, the most recent test I took was the Addiction Medicine Board, and it had a question about uh, methoqualone, which was something that you know was around when I was in, in college. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it sort of like disappeared, and here it was in an addiction medicine test. And I thought, how 
how relevant is that? So it seems like there's a passion for bringing up at least one really irrelevant item. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. And uh, we do see a little bit of uh, cocaine um, use and toxicity, and it does cause uh, similar types of problems. But for some reason, the amphetamine seems to cause elevated pulse and blood pressure across the board. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question uh, real fast. I think there's another one by Dr. Hensley in the chat, Dr. Quinn. Uh, the question looks like it's... Um, oh, uh, about uh, early dementia from methamphetamine correct. use. I, I think that's true, um, but usually what what we see are before it seems to get to their brains, uh, it seems to get to their heart first. And our, the life expectancy for the state of Hawaii is 83. It's the highest in the country. Um, and uh, uh, the life expectancy, the population, well, the homeless population using methamphetamine is 53. Uh, that, so it uh, knocks it down by uh, <clears throat> by 30 years. Uh, it's possible if they live longer, we would see more uh, dementia, which seems to be increasing in its incidence too. And it could well be related to, to thiamine deficiency. But I think that's another excellent point. Well, we're at the top of the hour and I uh, just want to say um, thank you again, Dr. Bush, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak to us about this topic, um, which we certainly uh, have a lot of uh, I think, um, experience in, but um, it's always uh, great to hear from someone who's uh, done a deep dive on this and, and also about the educational aspects of how to work with this, um, with this diagnosis in this population. So uh, thank you so much. And, and we really appreciate uh, your, your speaking to us. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It was a real privilege and pr pleasure to be able to speak with you all about this. And I hope it's been helpful. Take care. Have a thank have you. A Thank you. Aloha.